Talk about elk hunting. Time of year for season for elk hunting. Anyway, I <coughs> a number of days ago, actually about ten days ago, I saddled up two horses, one to ride, one to pack. I headed out of here, headed right out of home here. And ride right into elk country, right out of here, in the National Forest. And anyway, I headed out of here, and I was only only about six, seven hundred yards from home here, and out of sight of home, and further away, you know, another four hundred and some odd yards. I heard a about twenty six elk. Showed up on the ridge side all of a sudden. Twenty-five cows and a and a big six by seven bull. And anyway, I was caught right out in the middle of a flat. And the only place to tie up to was this sagebrush. So I got off my horse and. Tied up to the sagebrush and grabbed my rifle out of the scabbard and the other horse was altered up to the saddle horn of the horse I was riding and these are two two draft cross mares and they get along really well and I headed I headed out walking about a hundred yards or so further, got in, or it drops off into the creek there, and, and these cows just kept sheltering and sheltering this bull. Couldn't get a clear, couldn't get a totally clear opening for enough moments to be able to shoot this bull. And this went on for about 20 minutes. Those elk just kind of stayed put. Those elk were watching those two horses and they really wasn't paying any attention to me, situated totally still in those, in that, on that big, great big rock that I was laying down in behind. And, and anyway, the elk got nervous. And when elk get nervous, it's always the cow. You know, fouls up the whole program, and a couple of the cows just kind of started to move kind of quick, and just as that, these these elk just left right out of sight, in just a just an instant. Well, I got up and walked in sight where I could see the horses, and they were standing exactly how I left them. You know, twenty some minutes before, they didn't. They didn't mess around. They didn't monkey around at all. They just stood right there, and these obvious that these two horses were equally watching these elk. Anyway, I walked back to the horses, and I got on them. I made a pretty good circle, went down in the creek and up the creek, and circled around. Trying to locate them, and anyway, I got under some high country and I rode down a bench. And the horse I was riding, he smelled something, and these elk had evidently went across this this bench, and it doesn't. It's a bench that doesn't pick up tracks very well, and one thing or another. And I got onto kind of a little higher point, and I discovered that there was. A considerable number of elk, you know, about a mile, about a mile west, and I thought, well, those elk, as fast as an elk travels, those elk could have caught up with this other great big bunch of elk, and uh, there was something, well over a hundred head of elk in this bunch, and I studied them for quite a while, and the elk were actually right over, you know, on some private property, headed right into right in the forest and 
if you know anything in the world about elk hunting, when, when the elk go somewhere, you're not going to catch up with them. I was trying to discover exactly where they went. So I just simply, you know, had to make a judgment and I just returned back home. And, you know, I was back home by nine something in the morning and, you know, but it was kind of an exciting, exciting morning. And one thing you know that it just didn't work out. And this is, this is what hunting is about. Sometimes things just don't work exactly. So I didn't give up. I spent day after day, I spent seven more, seven more days looking and I took one day, one day to, to rest and kind of, you know, but I kept watching, watching country and glassing country and traveling and glassing from different places and one thing or another and I didn't locate a single elk anywhere. And I was going a number of mornings and traveling into more country and I was using my 90 year old hunting buddies, you know, Honda 1000, travel back into some other country. And I, you know, saw some elk sign, one thing or another. And anyway, the third day of traveling into some country, you know, that rig just, just getting light enough to just see not far ahead. Going up a ridge with some bent head of cow elk. And very, very early, just barely, barely able to see, you know, in the morning. And those, those elk, of course, are going up the ridge because they're paying attention to the noise. I was traveling real, real, just creeping along. They stopped and they all turned turned their heads and they turned their heads and looked right straight back where they had come from. And I said to myself, you know, they're looking at the bull. There's a bull and they're looking at the rest of these elk, you know. And I know the country and there's a way to go up country a ways and going around and make a circle and come down into a different place of country. and. So I took me a little little bit to get there. I don't know, probably seven, eight minutes or something like that. I got I got off into where I needed to be, and and I could see with my naked eye, you know, help a little bit of distance coming up coming up a ridge there, and I immediately stopped and grabbed my rifle, and I got out and. Got out and I got chambered up around and I got a got a very good rest and it was about somewhere around 225 250 yards I didn't bother to range find it didn't range need to range find at that distance and I see there's about 50 some odd head of elk and a few of the cows stopped momentarily and they're looking back again looking back Coming up out of kind of just a pressure just beyond the top of this ridge back, come this big bull. And he just he just walking along, he just walking along. Well this is a big old, big old mature bull walking along and I'm I'm leading him, I'm leading him, you know, ready to shoot the instance he stopped and he stopped. When he stopped in just an instant, I shot. Elk dropped like, like a rock. And you know, <clears throat> I'm shooting my seven millimeter by four hundred four Wapiti Express with one seventy five nozzler partitions, starting out about thirty two forty. I've killed a tremendous amount of elk with that one seventy five nozzler partition. Anyway. We'll get back to the bullet. So I got in the, got back in the outfit, and I took notice, you know exactly where this was, because there's kind of rolling draws and gullies and one thing and another, little ridges, little humps, you know. 
there was a little lone, little lone scrub tree, and I referenced that elk to that little scrub tree, and I drove drove the outfit down. Once I got off of kind of this little little two track that there was, a very fake two track that there was, very rough in one thing or another, real very very rocky, and so I had to kind of work my way around and finally got just slightly above slightly above where this I thought that this elk was and turned it so I could kind of look at green and one thing or another and put my glasses up and kind of look down you know and I can see that I can't see the body but I can see the antlers I can see the antlers you know sticking up so I worked on down around and about through these rocks and Drove up about three feet. Oh, but anyway, when I hit that, when I hit that bull, as I say, he went down like a rock. But he was right straight back up in an instant. Now he was right straight back up. His hind legs were under him, and he was he was up in the air. He was vertical. He wasn't standing on anything with his front legs. He was vertical, believe it or not. I broke his back right at the top of his shoulders. It, it, it ends up that that's where I hit him. And he was only vertical just for an instant. He fell over. He fell over, and when he fell over, he kind of rolled, and all four legs went right straight up in the air. And he kind of thrashed there for just a moment. When he tipped down on the side and he moved his head around just a little bit and then everything just went totally still and at that you know that's when I got in the got in the outfit and headed over there to him and now this is a big old herd bull six by seven bull very nice very nice bull I think he was kind of you know He's a little bit beyond his prime. He's probably 10, 11 years old, I would say. I retrieved the ivories out of out of this bowl. By the wear on these ivories, I would I would say that he's right at around that age. And always when I always when I'm hunting elk, I've always got about five razor sharp knives. Because I've been there many and many of times. I'm all by myself, and I started working on this elk. And after a fashion, I got the I got the guts rolled out of him. And once I got the guts rolled out of him, I cut the heart off of everything, because we saved the heart because this heart fixed properly in a slow cooker is very very good, and they're even better if they're corn. Corned, corned elk heart is just out of this world, and it's, it's it's so tender that you just cut it with your fork. I'll put the recipe in the description below. Anyway, I worked on this. I worked on this elk, and I would I would rest. I would rest. You know, I'm two months from seventy-four years old. When you start getting a little bit of age on you, you can do everything that you did before, but you don't do it as easily. So I'd work on it for a little bit, and I'd just sit down in the Honda, and I had a, I had a protein energy drink with me that I had mixed up, and I'd drink some of that, and and I checked myself to see. To see how I'm doing and whatnot, I I travel with with an oximeter to check my my pulse and my my heart rate and one thing or another. And I was checking this about <coughs> every 15 minutes, and everything said that I was doing just fine. Anyway, you know I'd rest for rest for maybe seven eight minutes or maybe longer. And I'd go back to working on it till it felt like I was, you know, pushing it a little bit. It took me about three and a half hours, and 
got all all four all four legs cut off. I cut the hinds off right at the ball joint. And once I get all that done, then I had to work on rolling the elk over. Roll it over so I kinda get it up on its on its brisket and one thing or another and then I take a knife and I go down each side of the backbone bone the backbone out take the back straps out of the out of the elk you know cut along the ribs all the way along and just retrieve those and on the back strap back strap out of a bull elk is about this long you know it's about four feet long or so and it's about that big around and you know <laughs> it's too bad that a that a bull elk doesn't have about a 300 pound back strap <laughs> because man, back strap is back strap is just awesome, you know. <laughs> Got about three quarters of an inch thick, you know, fried up real good, about medium rare, with just a little bit of salt. And anyway, I got that all done. Now part of the hardest chore is getting the getting the head, you know, cutting the, cutting around and getting the head getting the head all cut off. I had everything else loaded up in the Honda. And, you know, the tailgate down on the Honda, and it's got a tip box on it, but the tip box wouldn't do me any good because just lay something in there and it slide right back out. So anyway, I made sure that that was locked in good position so it wouldn't tip my load out of there. And it's absolutely all I could do to, to, lift, this, to lift this head and some of the neck portion and that elk rack into the back end of the Honda. And, I always carry, I always carry about twenty some odd feet of nylon rope because I've been there before on steep mountainsides and all sorts of things. And when you don't have anybody with you, you got to have you got to have help. And I try to put a loop around the help where I can tip him up. A little bit there and take the rack take the rack there and connect it to the connect that rope to the rack with a bowling knot and people that pack this country know what a bowling is we all we all know how to tie a bowling if we're elk hunters and travel with horses and the thing another and tie that where Head kind of stretched out a little bit, tie it off to sagebrush or something. I carry a small, about a 10 inch long, fold up saw and it cut all the way around my knife and saw that elk, saw that spine in two, and that uses up quite a bit of energy. I got to rest a couple of times to get cut through all that. And finally, Finally got got it all all done and I got it barely could lift that head into the back end of the Honda and I got the tailgate closed up and took that rope still hooked onto the rack there, you know, and there's nothing to tie on the side of that thing at all. That's the only thing missing. But down down in front of the front back wheel, kind of a Kind of a step affair there, one thing or another. It's got a couple of holes through it and whatnot, and I slipped that rope through there, and I didn't want to tip that rack out of the back end coming down out of that rough, rough train going over, going over rocks the size of your head and twice that size, you know, creeping over at times or between them and one thing or another. But it all, it all stayed, stayed put and made it in, made it in okay. But anyway, I want to I want to emphasize that in my this is my 59th year of, of hunting elk. I've been on lots and lots, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of elk kills, elk that I and family and and you know friends, people that hunted years and years ago when I did some guiding, one thing or another. So. This is this isn't my first rodeo, and 
I want to emphasize that in all the all the years that I hunt, and I've used many many combinations of of cartridges, bullets, rifles, and one thing or another, that for a lot of years, for many many years, one of the big sevens is my mostly my go-to rifle. Not always, but mostly a 175 Mauser Partition. You folks can have all your thin jacketed worthless 175 bullets that are out there. You can have all your damn EDL X Hornady bullets. You can have all your damn Burger bullets and one thing or another. John Nosler was a very sharp individual and he built one of the greatest bullet companies that ever came along. And he developed the Nosler Partition 70 some odd years ago. And there's still not a better bullet made, really, than 175 Nosler Partitions. There are a few that are very acceptable, good game bullets. That's the Barnes line of the Barnes X Triple Shock bullets. But I've killed probably somewhere around 30 some odd head elk for the 175 Nosler Partition out of these big sevens. I went many years ago, you know, over 40 some years ago, to a bigger K7 millimeter after having used it in the 7 Remington Magnum. It did, didn't have the punch then, it doesn't have the punch now. Just like the so called wonderful PRC loaded with again some worthless damn bullets, it doesn't have the velocity to get her done. Big 7 shines when you push that bullet at around 3,200 feet a second or a little better. And it will take an elk. It will kill an elk and that bullet will drive in and do its job at virtually any angle that you have to shoot that elk at. And it will always perform. It just kills elk wonderfully well. And you know, in a lot of number of years after I developed that cartridge, built rifles for other people. Winchester came out with the 7mm STW that Lane Simpson, you know, had necked down the 8mm mag to 7mm. Now that's virtually the same case capacity as my 7mm by 404. And, you know, we've had it for a lot of years, the 7mm by 300 Weatherby, the 300 necked down to 7mm. These all got the same case capacity. And I knew what cast capacity I needed when I pursued this many, many years ago. And it really turned up to be a winner. But now, the 7mm SDW is almost a thing of the past. Yeah, there's people out there using them. But the very best commercialized 7mm that ever came around was the 7mm SDW because of the case capacity. You know, Nosler's come up with their 28 Nosler, but it lacks about 75 to 100 feet a second equal in these other three cartridges. Because, of course, we've got a situation here where we've got a young crowd, you know, involved doing some of these things. And they haven't been there, they haven't done it, they don't know. But I've been there, I've done it, I do, do it repeatedly. And I've built rifles, more of these 7 millimeter rifles, big K 7 millimeter rifles, than I think anybody around. And I have the experience, I have the know how, I have the field experience. And, you know, many, many years ago, when I developed these, developed this 7 millimeter 404, you know, Sierra offered to give you a ballistics print out based on your velocities and your bullet and one thing or another. And I got a lot of that information from Sierra and I use that over, over many, many years and still use it today. I find it very, very reliable information. Now, when I first started doing this, I made a 175 semi-spitzer and I and another fella through contacts with somebody at somebody at at, at Nosler 
they finally made 175 seven millimeter Spitzer. And that bullet, we were the very first ind individuals, I and another fellow to test those bullet. I was the first man to ever kill an elk, to ever kill an elk with that 175 Spitzer bullet. And we were provided about 100 of those, 150 of those from Nosler, you know, to experiment with and get back and do some drop tests and one thing another shooting game and, and so forth. This is how this has come about. We're involved from the get-go. But anyway, and some of these things have been in print. And I wasn't the only man using the 175 Nozzle partitions. The late gun writer, gun magazine writer, the late Bob Hagel from Idaho, he swore by the 175 Nozzle partition man can use one of those seven millimeter rifles with one with my muzzle brake and by the way my muzzle brake you don't have to have hearing protection in the field when you shoot a time or two to kill an elk I've never found it necessary you've got people that shy from muzzle brakes because the muzzle brakes are made wrong they're made with great big damn holes that send a hell of a lot of blast to your ears that's not the case I've never been bit never been bit with what I what I developed and what I put on the rifles that I build. And I can test to that because I do it. I've been doing it for quite a long time. And anyway, I've talked about velocity before. Velocity and energy go together. Also trajectory. And everything that's been sold Virtually everything that's been sold to us with these very high ballistics coefficients are not properly designed for game. They have ballistics coefficient, but they don't have the rest of the package. They don't have it. The bullets won't hold together. They don't do the job. And I can attest testify to the fact that the 175 nozzle partition stands out head and shoulders far above virtually anything else out there and it'll perform at long range it'll perform at six seven eight hundred yards if you have to shoot that far you know I've got equipment you know to be able to shoot a long ways but I Try to limit myself to around five or six hundred yards. This thousand yard crap has just got completely out of hand, and most of it is all phonied up and lies and lies and lies mm -hmm. as what's happened here with this, and it's very unfortunate. And we've got wounded game, we're losing game, it's tough to find game anymore in our part of the country. A man that knows that knows his business like I know my business and I know hunting, the gun business and hunting.